In the footprints of the Twin Towers, Michael Arad designs a memorial to honor those who lost their lives on 9-11. I want to make it a living part of the city again without erasing the past, without forgetting. But his vision has a deadline. Nothing matters until we open this on the 10th anniversary. If we don't get it open on the 10th anniversary, it's all for nothing. Will the 9-11 memorial be done on time? Will One World Trade Center be the icon its creators hope for? Just after midnight, a flatbed truck arrives in New York City. It's carrying a 35-ton beam, a small piece of a massive puzzle taking shape in downtown Manhattan. Its final destination, Ground Zero, where the Twin Towers collapsed in the worst terrorist attack in American history. Now, almost a decade later, this 16-acre site bustles with construction as one World Trade Center rises, soon to be America's tallest skyscraper. Going back into the sky is really important because that's something that was taken away and I think it's appropriate to put it back to show that the life of the city goes on and is more powerful than the forces that attacked it. On a mild winter's day, the 35-ton steel beam that arrived the night before is hoisted into position. Good job, man. It's just one of thousands of difficult and dangerous jobs construction workers are tackling here as this enormous 16-acre site is rebuilt. But to get to this point took years of bitter debate over what should be done with Ground Zero. Everyone had a different idea and a different vision of what should happen there. Some important figures didn't want any memorial, wanted the whole thing redeveloped. Others said you can't develop anything down there, it all has to be uh, preserved. So pulling everything together was, was not an easy task. After many frustrating false starts, a plan came together and the hard part of building it has now begun. This is one of the most complex engineering challenges because of the size of the site and everything's built over and under and next to and connected. Do you ever try to build a building around a railroad? Not easy. This is a once in a lifetime, once in a generation, once in a history of the United States project. This is about fundamentally rebuilding an entire downtown and creating a new city within a city. When complete, the site in Lower Manhattan will include a train station to rival Grand Central, six new towers, and at its heart, the 9-11 Memorial, built in the sacred footprints of the original Twin Towers. What people will walk away with, no matter what, now and in the years to come, is they'll understand, I hope they'll understand, the magnitude of the event. The memorial will help us look back and remember those who died in the attack. And right next to it, a skyscraper that its creators hope will become an architectural icon. One World Trade Center will help us look forward. The challenge of building this new tower begins with world-renowned architect David Childs, who's putting his reputation on the line. Can he come up with a design that reflects the importance of this site? Can he satisfy the safety demands of a building that could easily be a target again? There are all sorts of levels of achievements that you want to have in the building. If you write them all down, as I did at that time, um, you'd overwhelm. You thought, how do I ever get all of this together? It comes together in a design that is a conscious attempt to balance security with beauty. 
by pushing basic building materials, concrete, steel, and glass to their limits. The first 20 stories are like a bunker, built to withstand the force of a truck bomb. As it rises, the tower transforms into eight interlocking triangles covered in huge panels of crystal clear glass. More than 100 stories up, a broadcast antenna brings the total height to a symbolic 1,776 feet. With a price tag of more than $3 billion, Child's design will be one of the most expensive skyscrapers ever built and one of the most innovative. We needed to investigate and invent new ways to show how buildings could be built in the future. If we were trying to do this 50 years ago, we would not have had the technologies to be able to do this building. Almost 50 years ago, the most innovative towers of the time were being built at the World Trade Center site. The original twin towers employed a unique state-of-the-art steel structure that allowed for wide open floor spaces where up to 40,000 people could work each day. But decades after completion, these marvels of engineering proved vulnerable in a way no one had foreseen. Childs watched the events of 9-11 unfold from his office in downtown Manhattan, where at 8.46 a.m., the North Tower was struck by an airplane. I remember walking up to a window, and a young man turned to me with tears coming down his face, and he said, will they fall down? And I said, no, right away, because I knew that if they hadn't been knocked over, they wouldn't fall down. The fire would be put out. Never has a steel structure building in the history of steel structured buildings ever fallen down for the reasons of fire. Also watching, but from a more dangerous vantage point, was David Barry. He was in the South Tower. They, they had come on the loudspeaker and said, you know, to stay in the building. And for good reason, they were in the South Tower. You know, stuff was coming out of the North Tower. Um, they had no idea what was going to happen in the South Tower. Then the South Tower is hit. Both buildings are in flames. But these are no ordinary fires. They are as hot as 1,800 degrees hot enough to weaken the steel structure. Inside, people try to flee the buildings down smoke-filled staircases. As they do, rescue workers try to push their way up. At the point of impact, the emergency staircases are compromised. Nearly 2,000 people on the floors above are trapped inside with no escape. Those people who didn't leave early got stuck and particularly in the South Tower, in particular where he was, he was on the 89th floor, so, you know, they were stuck. The North Tower stands for an hour and 42 minutes, the South Tower for 56 minutes. Finally, the steel structure gives way to the heat. The floors start to sag. The perimeter steel columns snap. The Twin Towers do the unthinkable they collapse. Nearly 3,000 people die. The unimaginable becomes a new reality that David Childs must face. To build a tower that is strong enough to withstand catastrophic events and save lives. Along with a team of architects and engineers, he must rethink strength and safety from the inside out, starting at the core. The core of a skyscraper is a backbone that runs up the center. It provides structural support and strength. The core of One World Trade Center also contains critical safety systems like extra wide stairwells. And it's made of a material that's strong, like steel, but more fire resistant. Concrete. The 
outside of the core, this whole center spine of the building is out of concrete. The cores in the Twin Towers were compromised on 9-11 because they were made of steel wrapped in thin sheetrock. Where the, uh, the planes hit, that sheetrock was not strong enough to take that punching shear, which of course the concrete is. With its high compressive strength, concrete can resist impact in a way that sheetrock can't. Child's design calls for super strong concrete, so strong it means going back to the lab to develop it. This is a concrete specimen that will be used for Tower 1 at the World Trade Center. If you could set this cylinder and put a platform on it, you can accommodate a thousand Americans standing on this cylinder. Uh, you know, normal people, 175 pounds in weight. A thousand people can be supported by this four inch diameter cylinder. Concrete is made of sand, stone, and binding agents like lime or cement that, when water is added, hold the mixture together. But the recipe can be revised by using less water, replacing it instead with chemicals that keep the concrete moist without reducing its strength. Water makes this concrete move in place, but you can't have too much water because when you have too much water, the strength goes down. The goal, to make concrete that can withstand loads of up to 14,000 pounds per square inch. Normal concrete is about 5,000 PSI. Even the Hoover Dam is no more than 7,500. But strong concrete has its own challenges. Before the recipe is ready for One World Trade Center, it must be tested under real-world conditions, where it's mixed by the ton. The stronger the concrete, the harder it is to move. When concrete spreads too far, it's got too much liquid, a sign that it's lost strength. If it doesn't spread enough, the concrete is too thick and will be impossible to pump hundreds of feet up the building before it sets. Right now, the mix still is extremely sticky. And uh, I think once we multiply it with 30, 40 stories, it will not comply to our needs. As the crew tweaks the recipe, they adjust the amount of water and chemicals until finally, after two days, they get it right. If we didn't do this today and we actually just said, you know, let's ship it to the job and give it a shot, uh, it would have been a disaster. Twice a week, around 1,000 tons of concrete are mixed and dispatched to One World Trade Center. It is always a race against time. Driver Eric Zempel has only 90 minutes before the concrete starts to harden. Concrete's a perishable item. We have like an hour and a half to get the load off. Along the way, his mixer keeps the concrete moving. Once he arrives on site and offloads his cargo, Crews have less than an hour to pump it through an elaborate system of hoses, where it is poured into a mold and secured with steel bars called rebar that give the concrete something to latch on to. It's strong. That's why I call it liquid steel. <laughs> when finished, one World Trade Center will contain almost 500,000 tons of this liquid steel, much of it in its core, which has walls up to six feet thick. Inside, the core protects a total of 70 elevators, as well as the extra-wide stairwells that are pressurized to keep smoke out. When a door is open, that pressure goes out, keeping the smoke away from it. And uh, that's, that's a very effective thing. Smoke is a real killer. All these life safety systems are there for one reason, to avoid the tragedy of 9-11, where two thirds of the victims died because they couldn't get out of the building. And nothing will remind us of this loss so poignantly as the 9-11 memorial next door.
The 9-11 memorial is the vision of another architect who witnessed the events of that day. I remember that day very clearly. It was, it was very um, surreal. I mean, there is a sense of utter destruction and chaos. On September 11, 2001, Michael Arad watched the towers fall from the roof of his apartment. In the days and weeks that followed, he mourned with everyone else, going to the places where people gathered. The experience that for me was most poignant was actually late one night coming to, uh, to Washington Square Park and uh, finding a, a group of people standing around that central fountain. I think people came there alone, but when they were there, standing around that fountain, they were, and I was, we were together. And I felt one with the city and with everyone else around me in a way that I'd never felt before. When a competition to design a 9-11 memorial was announced, Arad knew exactly what it should be. It was an idea that was just in my head and then on a piece of trace paper and then eventually I ended up building a small fountain on my rooftop. Two pools in the footprints of the original towers. It was a design that spoke to jury members who chose it out of 5,000 entries. I'd like to thank the jury members for having confidence in me and selecting my design. Paula Berry was on the jury. Having lost her husband on 9-11, she helped represent the families of those who died. It had a very solemn, sacred feel to it. It's a place which really does convey the absence of something and the voids. Using the footprints of the two towers as the starting point for, for the memorial, is actually very powerful symbolism. You know, where there was presence, there is now absence. Where there was solid, there is now void. This is actually the model that I presented to the, to the jury um, back in 2003. And it's, it's starting to show its age. Now, the challenge is to get from concept to construction, and fast. The memorial on the earlier construction schedules wasn't going to be done until 2013. And that was clearly unacceptable. Chris Ward is the executive director of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, the government agency that owns and manages the site. He assumed his post in 2008. When work began on Ground Zero, the plan was to build from the bottom up starting some 80 feet below ground level, where extensive damage had to be repaired and the foundations laid for the many structures that would someday occupy the site. The memorial was only one of those structures. We quickly realized the size and the dimension of the project was so large, it was almost, it was almost unmanageable because you had no real sense of priority. And that was really what was hindering the site. Once we decided that the memorial would be our goal, you had to completely change everything about your construction strategies and how you attack that one problem. Ward enlists a team of engineers to create a plaza at ground level first and build the memorial pools down into it. It adds hundreds of millions of dollars, but shaves two years off the schedule a critical decision to meet the one deadline that cannot be missed. September 11, 2011, the 10th anniversary. We just have to have a memorial done on the 10th anniversary. That's not uh, a wish, that's an obligation. The 10th anniversary is probably the most important one, certainly to the family members, right? So we need it as a means and as a marker. The eyes of the world, the entire world, will be fixed on Ground Zero to get this memorial open and dedicated on the 10th anniversary. However, the actual construction, it's going to be close. 
success is not built in. At the memorial, from now on, every day counts. Ronaldo Vega supervises construction at the memorial. He's been on site since 9-11. First to help in the cleanup, and now to make sure the memorial is done on time. We just got to get it built, and we're in a tough time schedule, and uh, we need to finish this on the 10th anniversary. That means we may be putting in double, triple shifts to get it done. So that panel is coming down. It's going to be set into place with two anchors from the bottom. It slides into the slots that are at the top and the bottom. And then the next piece will lock it into position. With the plaza in place, the memorial pools are ready to be lined with granite, cut from a quarry in Virginia. Almost 5,000 tiles must be laid in a specific order so there is a continuous pattern to the grain. Just look at that stone. If you could just imagine not the, the lines not being there, it looks like one stone. Look at how that grain just flows. It's almost as though this stone is a continuation of this stone. The adjacent piece looks like it belongs next to it. Each of these pools is 30,000 square feet, almost an acre of void. It's, uh, you can really feel it in, uh, in your chest. It's in the, the presence of absence here. But this is just the beginning. The design calls for 52,000 gallons of water to cascade over the walls every minute, drop 30 feet, and disappear into a second inner pool. But executing this plan is deceptively complex. Fountains sound simple, they're not. They're such a combination of the sublime and the beautiful, but they're also you know, powerful engines of pumping, you know, 600,000 gallons of water day in and day out. And we're doing two of them. We didn't want to create a torrent. This is not about being behind Niagara Falls. It was always about um, creating something that is gentle yet persistent. And then the question is, how do you make that idea uh, take shape. The solution arrives on site. It's called a weir. Weirs are normally used to alter the flow of rivers to prevent flooding. But here, they need to move water into the shape of an architect's vision. The weirs are there to push it outward just far enough to give it a gentle arc to make it fall in a neat cascade. Each weir has to be leveled to within a sixteenth of an inch. If it's not level, then the water will, will go more over one spot than another, and it won't look right. So that's why it's got to be dead level. Underground, an elaborate system of pumps and pipes will send the water up to the weirs. Those are the pumps that supply the water to the upper trough. The entire system is filled with New York tap water, which will be recycled. Those are the headers that act as the return from the pool. A series of filters keeps the water clean. With the weirs in place, the most important test is ready. It's time to turn on the water. Workers carefully watch as water starts to flow through the system into the troughs by the side of the pool. Things are holding pretty good, so we're going to go ahead and, uh, and uh, let it go over. Let's get it over the top right okay. now. Yeah, but you're pretty good all the way around. Huh? It's just coming over there. It's starting to go over here, too. Yeah, yeah. That wall, that looks, oh, the, yeah. wind is, the wind is doing there it. There it goes. After years of preparing, the test is a glimpse of what the memorial pools will finally look like. The idea of 
creating this angled weir that would project the water forward four to six feet as it falls 30 feet, it allowed us to, to create this beautiful visual effect of the water almost like a, a billowing curtain. Beautiful. It's just moving. I am um, a lost for words. Twin towers once stood are starting to take shape as the heart and soul of Ground Zero. But the countdown to the 10th anniversary is on, and there's still a lot to accomplish. Nothing matters until we open this on the 10th anniversary. If we don't get it up on the 10th anniversary, it's all for nothing. We have to get it up on the 10th anniversary. And every day, every hour, we're fighting for that. Next door at One World Trade Center, the challenge is different. People still wonder, should it be built at all? After 9-11, there was a cry, and there was a reaction that people said, we were not going to build tall towers anymore. But skyscrapers have a very important urban responsibility. They bring people together in a close, coordinated, dense environment where people need to and want to be close to each other. But does such a dense environment invite another attack at ground zero? David Childs must protect against it, especially at the base of the building. The terrorist models lend itself to the idea of uh, truck bombs and lends itself to large explosive devices getting to the site and um, threatening that tower. A security review pushed Childs to design a one-of-a-kind structure called the podium. It makes up the entire base of the building, 200 square feet wide by 185 feet tall, nearly one-fifth of the tower. Built with thick walls of concrete, reinforced with enormous steel columns, the podium is strong enough to protect the base from the impact of a massive truck bomb. But creating a fortress is not the message Childs wants to send. The initial worry that I had is that I didn't want to have this appear to be a concrete bunker, as the phrase was used. In an attempt to make the podium more inviting, he designs soaring entryways. Behind them, giant concrete blast walls protect the lobby, but Italian marble will hide their true purpose, and large openings will allow sunlight to stream in. Because of the nature of the destruction that was here before, you don't want to give the impression that this is a place of refuge and of uh, fear. You want it to be a sense of openness to it. This building needs to appear open. He comes up with a novel and risky idea. Surround it with glass, but not just any glass, prismatic glass that reflects the sun during the day and emits light at night. So the base of the building can, in fact, emanate light. And it's that kind of sense of mystery that light can really bring to a building, make it something that you want to walk towards and be engaged with and being welcome to it. We're always looking to try to come up with unique ideas and uh, unique forms. And I think there was this idea of kind of creating this sort of jewel box the sort of um, refraction of light that you got from using a prism. It's a delicate effect, but to take its place at the base of the building, the glass must be super strong. No one knows if those two goals can be achieved at the same time. We've spent now several years uh, developing and adapting our equipment in order to meet what was originally uh, an architect's concept. This concept being this one inch thick glass uh, etched out into a, uh, a, a pointed pattern for reflection and then laminated for a, to make a very thick, extremely strong barrier glass. And while this was a, a great concept, the challenge to us is this had never been done before. This company specializes in making strong yet clear glass. 
the kind used in airplanes, military vehicles, even armored cars. But for one World Trade Center, there's a critical difference, size. Uh, this glass is uh, one inch thick glass, 130 inches wide and 159 inches long. Each individual piece of glass is 1,800 pounds, almost a ton of glass in one single piece. To create these one-of-a-kind panels, they start the old-fashioned way. Take sand, combine it with other ingredients like lime and baking soda, and put it in a furnace at temperatures nearly 3,000 degrees. The intense heat turns the mix into liquid, which is then poured onto molten tin. The glass appears as a red line floating on top. On rollers in a line almost a quarter of a mile long, the glass cools, strengthens, and takes on its shape. At the end, it's cut into large 1,800-pound panels. But it doesn't always work. Sometimes the glass shatters, revealing weaknesses caused by uneven cooling. And, and you can hear that glass in the background just going down. So even though we look at this as a, uh, a momentary disaster in our process, that told us what we need to do to make the correction in an engineering sense. So this glass will now get uh, totally recycled, remelted. They need to melt it down and start again, adjusting the heat so inside and out the glass cools more evenly. But even when it's finished, this is just the start of the journey. Next, these enormous panes of glass are placed on ships and sent halfway across the world. Weeks later, they arrive in the town of Daya Bay in southern China, where glass can be cut more cheaply. Using the giant panes made in Pennsylvania, they will try to create prismatic glass at full scale. Cutting grooves into glass this thick and this large has never been done before. The only way to do it is to build a new machine from scratch. Its three wheels grind the glass while another three smooth out the grooves. Now the cut glass is laminated to another giant pane to make it extra thick. But will it hold up? Very nice. For such a high-tech product, the test is simple and revealing. Three, two, one. It's not surprising that it breaks, but it's designed to stick together like safety glass. Three, two, one. Instead, these panes break into dangerous shards. All right, as you can see, the debris are pretty big. Something like that would fall on your head that would not be uh, pleasant. No. So this is why we do these kind of tests. When the results of these tests reach New York, the news is heartbreaking. This building is David Child's legacy. He spent years and millions of dollars on an idea that may never see, much less reflect the light of day. If he can't fix this problem, a solution may be imposed on him, compromising his vision of a perfect blend of security and beauty. But above the podium, Childs is getting much better results. One World Trade Center is growing, going up a floor a week. Inside, there's a steady rhythm of work. Build out the floors with concrete, spray with fireproofing, lay elevator tracks in the core. All the way to the very top. As the building moves upward, it starts to take on its own distinctive shape. A lot of times, you know, older buildings be a box. This here, you have a square becoming an octagon, an octagon, a different, you know, a different octagon, all the way up until it's a square again, rotated at the top. That's harder to build than a box. The podium of One World Trade Center is a square about the size of the original towers. But as it rises above its base, at the 20th floor, the corners taper in. A square becomes an octagon, 
four sides become eight interlocking triangles. Finally, at the top, it resolves in a square once again. The profile, as you look from the memorial, is identical to the old, but as you walk around it, you see the corners tapering in. It's a new modern building, but it has a memory of what was lost. To achieve this subtle shape shift, Childs turns to steel, 45,000 tons of it. Steel is relatively light. It's flexible. You can do all sorts of things with it. It's supple. It's a wonderful material. Almost one quarter of it, 10,000 tons, starts here, Coatesville, Pennsylvania. One World Trade Center is designed to be a certified green building. Steel contributes to that because much of it comes from recycled materials, like old refrigerators, cars, even toasters, all melted down into liquid. Then it's poured and molded into giant sheets. kind of like working a piece of pizza dough where you want it to stretch one way and stretch the other way so that the grain structure are all worked evenly to get the proper strength that they need for the steel. The sheets are carefully cut, welded, and shaped to make pieces that fit in a specific place in the building. Some of the largest are called nodes. They can be as large as 60 tons and stand three stories high. Nodes are giant joints that hold multiple pieces of steel together. They come in all shapes and sizes and make it possible for the building to shift form from four sides into eight. And they also help redistribute the weight as the building rises. Back at the site, a critical node is ready to be hoisted into place. Working with steel this big takes experience. Peter Jacobs is a member of the Mohawk Nation, famed for their work on skyscrapers and bridges for over a century. His work starts at the base of the building, where he moves giant crane hooks called chokers into place. Two cranes lift the massive 40-foot high node hundreds of feet up, where it's now connected to the building. It's a dangerous job, connect. Very, it's the most dangerous job out of all of them. And if you ain't got the heart, that's the whole key to it. Right in there. But all this steel will soon be invisible, hidden behind panels of glass called the curtain wall. Today, the first piece of that wall arrives. It's the first piece of architecture being installed, the Tower One site. It's That's a really great. big moment. Yeah. Each glass panel consists of laminated safety glass on the inside, an insulating airspace, and another thick pane of glass on the outside lined with an energy-saving coating. The coating lets sunshine in while reducing heat resulting in cost savings in office lighting and air conditioning. Installing these panels is a painstaking task. They can weigh up to 5,000 pounds. For the last three years, they've been looking at how it's going to fit, but until you really get it in your hands, you start putting this jigsaw puzzle together, you really don't know what's going to fit and what's not. Down low, down down. The crew moves the panel into place, slowly and carefully. Just like that, keep coming. The curtain wall, it's a little bit different than you do the steel. It's a little more precise. It takes a little bit of time. When it comes to putting up iron, you know, there's a time to be finesse and there's a time to be giving it. The raising game guys, generally, we usually just give it. So. That's, that's the difference between us and them. 
Several hours later, the finessing and adjusting pays off. We got all three panels up, plenty of daylight left. We had a good day today. Hold on, hold on. Around number three of them, somewhere around 13,000 panels. So we got a ways to go still. When this wall of glass is complete, it will wrap around the entire building from the 20th floor to the top. It will make the building impermeable to the elements, yet part of its surroundings. Finally, David Child's vision is beginning to take shape. We wanted to create a, a building that uh, was open, welcome people to that uh, skyscraper form. And you also need to think about its symbolic value. It's the marker in the sky of the most important building down here, which is no height. It's the memorial itself. The pools are formed, the fountains are working, but the most delicate task remains to make sure this site honors those whose lives ended here and helps future generations remember the past. In a rarely seen hangar at New York's JFK airport, that past is being carefully preserved. In twisted steel and broken beams, the full scale of what happened on 9-11 can be witnessed. In smaller pieces, chairs, computers, a handful of bicycles, the human loss of that day is felt. Many of these objects will be taken back to ground zero. Some will be part of a massive underground museum being built beneath the Memorial Plaza. You're gonna be looking up at the underside of the, the plaza above, which is 60, 70 feet above us. So you have a very large volume of space. People are gonna understand the enormity, the scale of it, of what was lost here that day. On these bronze panels, powerful water jets engrave the names of the 2,982 individuals whose lives were lost. But even this is far from simple. How would names be grouped? What would be the logic of the arrangement? How would they be displayed? How would you find a single name? And what would be the significance of finding that name at a certain point? The names are not listed alphabetically, but by the locations where individuals died. The South Tower, the North Tower, flights 11, 93, 77, 175, and the Pentagon. First responders and those who died in the 1993 attacks are also grouped together. It, in essence, does tell the story of what happened, largely by the way in which the names are arranged. So when you go, you'll actually be able to sort of peel back and understand the story a little better. 50% of the folks that are on the memorial, no remains were found. And so this is going to be for many families and many loved ones, the place that they'll go on those special days, the birthdays, the anniversaries. Unfortunately, this is their final resting place. Heartbreaking, really. Look at all these people. You know, the pain they, them and their families endured. Sad, I mean, it is, but I gotta get a job done. Yeah. I'll get it done. As 152 bronze panels are carefully etched, 70 miles away, about 400 trees are being prepared to be taken to their new home, Ground Zero. They originally come from the three places where people died. New York, Pennsylvania, and the Washington, D.C. area. We have uh, over 400 trees. Uh, swamp white oaks is the predominant species. Now we're putting a brand new dress on them to bring them to the site. 
they will become part of an eight-acre forest on the Memorial Plaza. Beneath the plaza, a complex irrigation system has been devised to bring water and fertilizer to each and every tree. But what makes this system truly advanced is the sensor technology embedded in the soil. These trees have their own, their own computer chip in them. They have their own monitoring system for aeration and irrigation. I mean, each tree has its own little ecosystem. So we know how, they, how they're doing. It's all high tech, real high tech. And yet, when you look at it, it's just a beautiful little forest. 16 trees weighing 18,000 pounds each are being hoisted and prepared to move. It's a moment that's been a long time coming. It's a magical time today. There's, uh, there's nothing like planting a tree. Yeah, it's perfect. Beautiful. I don't want to say it's solemn, but it's, 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 it's respectful. It'll give, it'll give the families a sense that we're really going to do this. After nearly a decade, the memorial is finally nearing its completion. The first 16 trees will soon become 50, then 400, as life returns to ground zero. It's going to bring life at the same time. It's going to have its own cycle of life, death, and renewal, which is what trees do. And finally, the last major milestone. The installation of the panels etched with the names of the people who lost their lives. 152 panels will surround the pools. For Michael Arad, it's the final step to complete his vision as the day of the memorial's opening draws close. What's going to happen after September 11 is that we're going to open it to the public and it's going to completely change. And I'm very curious to see how, how it will be received, how it will be experienced, what place it will have in people's hearts and minds, you know. There's so many things that I suspect will hit people when they come here. I mean, we're commemorating the lives of close to 3,000 people and the humanity that was lost and the humanity that came forward, not just for the family members alone. I mean, this is done for the world. It's an expression of uh, how we respond to an event like this. Tragically, an opportunity was had. Um, and out of that terrible, terrible destruction, something still wonderful and creative and beautiful could come from it. The rebuilding of Ground Zero won't be finished for years. But one World Trade Center is well on its way to completion. David Child's original concept to cover the concrete podium with prismatic glass has been scrapped. Its replacement is yet undecided. But many of the skyscraper's safety features are likely to make it one of the most influential buildings in America. It is very important that we did rebuild and gave us a chance to rebuild better. And that's the, really the glory, I think, of this, of the, um, the statement that we came back the memorial will open on the 10th anniversary of 9-11, just as those responsible for it promised. History will look back on how we pulled together as a country and as a city, what we built. The memorial will be something that people will look at the way we look at Central Park and say, how could you not have it? It must have been here forever. On September 11th, 2011, this site, Ground Zero, will change its meaning. From a long watched and sometimes criticized construction site to a place of public gathering. 
for all the people who helped create it, and for people from all over the world. If you're passionate about documentaries, go online to view more programs, read articles and join the discussion at sbs.com.au forward slash documentary.